there's just so much in your talk that we can talk about. Um, so I'm going to try and fit a lot in. Uh, so we did get an interesting question on Twitter that essentially in the question, there is a lot going on in the question, and I hope you pick it apart. So the question says, contrary to an all positive the all positive training movement, can we say that a little stress frustration during learning isn't bad? So what do you think? Well, we had a speaker today talk a little bit about that. Um, my own experience is, you know, again, we think of that chart, some level of arousal is helpful, you know, because I think it tends to gin up the, the systems in the body. And as a result, um, I think one of, the, uh, one of the results of being a little bit stressed is, is being more attentive. Um, you know, one of the things when you're training sometimes, you know, there's that question of, can you get the dog to focus on you? Now, actually an interesting question I had that, you know, as I've been, you know, thinking more and more about this science article about oxytocin, you know, how many people in training, you know, you would teach people, you know, one of the first things you do is you train the dog eye, right? Look me in the eye. And so this question is, wow, is that, am I, am I doing something to the oxytocin in the dog? Um, would be kind of interesting because that would be the, the contrary to, to raising stress. But I'm not sure if maybe there's, there's, there's some kind of other arousal associated with that, that, that would be positive, the focus. Um, I think the other interesting part of that question was this idea of a all positive, whatever that might mean, and all. Yeah, and I guess that question is, um, are you deluding yourself by thinking that all positive means there's no stress? Um, you know, I think certainly, you know, again, if we think of stress in a more neutral fashion, that it's a form of arousal. I think when, you know, the dog is anticipating a reward or anticipating uh, performing a particular behavior or task. Um, one of the students that I worked with at Hunter actually just completed, let's see the title of, of um, this was da Danielle Allen. Um, it was a preliminary taxonomy of dog training videos on YouTube. Um, and we're going to be writing this up for publication. But what was very interesting, we looked at um, people who are training either sit, um, give paw, high five, or don't jump on me, you know, that kind of a thing. Because what we thought is sit's the most common behavior people teach first. Um, give five is probably the first trick anybody teaches a dog. And don't jump is probably the first behavior you want to inhibit. And um, among other things that we looked at were a number of behavioral measures of stress. And so we had this, you know, the ethogram was there, that chart. And it was interesting with, with the earlier discussion about, you know, all of these, these measures and the extent to which, you know, how, how hardwired are they as stress indicators versus conflict or anticipatory things, you know, because, you know, we saw some lip licking uh, you know, lip licking is kind of interesting because, um, you, know, you know, if you're going to be getting a treat, you know, maybe lip licking is, you know, you know Pavlovian gustatory behavior or something. Um, there was a little bit of yawning, uh, but I don't know if it was like intense. You know, we didn't see like intense yawning. Um, it was hard to read some of the stuff because you're on these videos. But we saw this constellation of things. Um, but when you put them all together, and I think you put them in the context, and I hope that was the message you were talking about earlier, getting it right, is you just can't take these, these individual behavioral indicators of stress and somehow think, you know, take them out of isolation of the context and everything else that's going on and think, oh my God, the dog lipped a lick and there was nothing, you know, that, that means the dog is stressed. I mean, the dog in the video showed a bunch of things and I don't know, that dog didn't even look all that bad off. <laughs> The idea of, um, I think there's some emerging research in this field of dogmanship, so examining both dogs and the people and how they're interacting and, and trying to measure why it is that some people just seem to be able to really click with dogs and read them really well and modify their behaviour quite smoothly and others, shall we say, struggle? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, and there, there's actually research coming out of the University of Sydney at the moment that's really trying to explore this a little bit more. And I think there's some in, in other areas as well. Have you been enjoying watching that sort of emerge? It's, it's kind of an interesting question. And, and actually, Hal Herzog and I were talking about it at lunch or something the other day. And, and it's kind of an interesting question. We think about the, the evolution, the co-evolution of people and dogs. But even before that, you know, how we needed 
Um, yeah, actually, I think um, Pam Reed and I wrote a chapter for the upcoming um, Serple's book on domestic dogs, and we say that applied animal behavior was probably the first discipline that, that humans ever did because you know, they needed applied animal behavior but to determine if that tiger was going to come after them um, or alternatively, which one of the antelope or deer in front of them was least likely to go. So I think that there was probably a time where there was selection for humans to be incredibly good at being able to read subtle signs of animal behavior. And I think once animals came to us wrapped in little plastic cartons, um, it wasn't as significant for us to be able to manage that process. So I think, you know, in the dog thing, I mean, it's, it's always interesting. I've worked with lots of people. I mean, I knew people who were extraordinary um, ethologists um, and their dogs were like, wow. I mean, they, I mean, and they didn't even know that their dogs were having issues. And alternatively, I've known other people. I mean, some of these old time guys I worked with, you know, 40 years ago with hounds, they were the most natural behavior handlers. I mean, they just, there was a feel. It's like a good horseman thing. I mean, you know, and obviously with horses, it's one of those ones where, I mean, you just can't make a horse do what they don't want to do. You know, so you really need to be able to read their behavior and, and, and move them around. The, um, I guess, yeah, being a, a, having a good grasp on all the theory and being a good practitioner do not always come hand in hand. We've been learning more about the importance of timing and things like that in training. Um, so yeah, it's definitely an interesting, interesting area uh, as more information comes out. Yeah, I think in some ways, you know, it's always that, that wonderful story, um, you know, of the person who, who loves music, can read music, can kind of hit the same keys that the little dots on the paper say, but they're not a great musician. You know, and, and then you've got that person who, you know, can just sit down at the piano and like just rip off a tune without, you know, needing to look at, at the, the page in front of them. So let's say I'm a person watching from, you know, I've just heard about stress in dogs for the first time. And now I'm a little confused because I look at a dog and I love dogs and I want to, you know, approach a dog on the street. What behaviors do you think this person should look for or attend to when they want to say hi to dogs on the street? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I always like to still go back to the question, you know, if you ask the owner, does your dog like other people? Mm -hmm. You know, that's sort of the start because, right. you know, if you, if you go up to that dog and they, you know, and, and they don't like to meet strangers on the street, it's not going to be really helpful for you to, to do anything at that point. Um, but then I think, you know, you go back to what we teach kids, you know, that, that handout, you know, let the dog come to you. Um, you know, the question of, you know, if you're going to pet them underneath the chin type of stuff, um, you know, but, but really uh, don't force anything. And I think that's usually the, where people end up with problems when they try to get, go too fast in that relationship. And I think there's actually research that suggests the interaction with a dog will last longer if you let the dog initiate the interaction. So if you just sit there and let it come to you, it'll stay with you longer than if you mm -hmm. force it. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. And, and also just given the physical variability in dogs, where do you, is it difficult for reading dogs that you would say? Let's say you want to look at behaviors to say, you know, uh, apart from the lip lick, they can, lick, they can all lick um, because they all have tongues, but you know, they can't all necessarily put their ears back. So if you did want to recommend to somebody, look at behaviors, where would you recommend that they look? Um, I will often tell people, you know, look at body position and body tenseness. You know, is the body tense? Does it look like, you know, you can see that the dog looks like they're, they're tensing up to do something. Um, look at the mouth position. Again, that's difficult because, you know, who knows with a bulldog, right? Uh, <laughs> You know, but, you know, that tight mouth versus, you know, the loose, comfortable mouth. Um, you know, the eyes, you know, looking at the eyes. Um, the ears obviously are difficult. Um, but, you know, as I say, it, the body can tell you a lot because you'll see if they're trembling, um, they're shaking or something like that. You know, that's a time to really think about, let's back off a little bit and not push the relationship at this moment. 
I'm going to bring in another question that we had coming in from somewhere else around the world. And that was your, uh, whether you have an opinion or if you'd like to share some of your experience about using pheromone therapy in a shelter environment. Um, okay. So <laughs> things like adapter adaptal and whether you know if they have an effect on cortisol. Um, I don't know what effect they have. Um, and this is the use of, you know, some, one of these dog appeasing pheromones or something like that in a shelter environment. I've had success recommending it in homes. And I think it makes some sense, particularly because of, especially if it's a single dog home, you know, because you're providing them with some sense of a con Pacific. In the shelter environment, I mean, the first thing I'm going to tell you is, you know, the, the standard practice for a good shelter is they have 10 to 15 air exchanges per hour. So, you know, that's to remove, to remove odors. So the, the, the smelly poop odor is being removed, but the dap odor is going to be removed as well. So in some ways, you're kind of wasting your time. Alternatively, the other piece in the shelter is, wow, there's 50 other dogs in the shelter. I mean, is, is whatever subtle pheromone you're providing going to somehow pierce through um, the, the odors being produced by 50 other dogs? I don't know so much. Um, where I would suggest perhaps of it being more useful is if you have dogs in isolation areas and, and perhaps spraying it onto a blanket or a bed that you're putting in with the dog. So rather than having it circulated in the air, have it onto an object because then it's going to be able to maintain closer in proximity with the animal. Um, another thing that's come up a lot today is the importance of environment and context. So if you have a dog, let's say from uh, a very impoverished environment like a puppy mill, and you've got, got a lot of people whose hearts are breaking, and they say, gosh, I want to get that dog into my home as soon as possible, could you tell us some of the challenges that a fearful dog can experience by going from uh, this impoverished environment to the loving home of a well-intentioned person? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, actually, Frank McMillan has, and his group have published on following up on both the breeding dogs from high volume breeding puppy mill establishments, as well as the puppies. Um, and we actually also recently published on dogs from cruelty cases. I mean, what we're tending to see is there are some, some sociability deficits. Um, it's more difficult for them to become comfortable with people. Um, it's also a little bit more difficult for them to be comfort, comfortable with new, new situations. Um, you know, the slide that I showed uh, um, yesterday in the talk about working with some of these dogs um, is novelty. I mean, they haven't come across um, stairs. They haven't come across toys. They haven't come across linoleum floors. I mean, they, none of those things are, so I think um, I, I don't know if it was Mike or somebody was talking about, you know, a, a, a room where everything is novel. I mean, you're battering this dog's senses. Um, you know, this is a dog who is coming from an isolation situation. And so in some ways, if you can slowly introduce them to everything, you know, uh, you know, you think about, it's like these movies where they find some guy who, you know, is abandoned as an infant in the jungle or on an island somewhere, and you need to slowly introduce him to society, you know, like, um, you know, this is a television, this, you know, boy, dogs get freaked out by TV if they've never seen it before, um, and doorbells and stuff like that. So, you know, slowly do that. And I think it's, uh, you know, there's been success. I mean, the dog I showed the other day, um, you know, the picture who I've lost him not so long ago. Um, you know, he was a puppy mill dog, you know, and he had some issues. And it took us a long time to slowly introduce him to things. So it's really a, a question of patience. I mean, if you're the per type of person who thinks you're going to get this dog and all of a sudden, you know, show up at the dog park um, and say, I just adopted a dog who was rescued from a puppy mill, um, eh, that's not going to work out so great for that dog. Um, but if you're the kind of person who you lead a quiet life, you know, you don't have a lot of people visiting, you can sit with that dog, much like that picture of, of, um, of Tuber sitting there, you know, spend four hours sitting on the living room floor with the dog in your lap petting, you know, you need to go there. Now, I want to ask you a little bit about your role with the Journal of Applied Animal Welfare Science, or JAWS as we affectionately call it. Um, 
What's been the most exciting or unexpected research paper that you've seen come through in your uh, the recent years or just the years that you've been involved with the journal? Um, I mean, there's a couple of interesting ones. Um, one of the first ones that we, we published that was kind of interesting, I was like, you know, if we publish something that sort of breaks, you know, a mythology. And um, Peter Borschelt was the, one of the authors on this one, and they did a factor analysis of dog behavior. And they came, you know, were able to show that, um, you remember the idea that if you play tug of war with a dog, it would make them dominant? You know, you can't play tug of war with your dog. You couldn't and, let them win. Yeah, well, you couldn't let, you know. And so, I mean, I thought that was kind of a cool thing that we were able to publish that. It was also, and it kind of speaks back to something the other day, you know, I mean, they did a factor analysis of dog behavior, so that was kind of interesting. You know, we did publish a series of papers from the National Council on Pet Population and Study on the reasons why dogs are relinquished to animal shelters and some of the, the characteristics related to those dogs. And it's really helped change our thoughts about, you know, what's happening in the shelters and, and where we can go with some of that. Um, the most recent paper that we had that really came out kind of cool, um, it's got nothing to do with dogs, I'm sorry, um, but it was uh, Diana Reese and her group published something related to um, the Taj -e, um, Dolphin Drive. And we published an article related to how those the dolphins were killed. And we just found out from the publisher from Rutledge that of all the journals that they published, in all the articles they published since 2012, um, if you count all of the different downloads, citations, social media notices, media contacts, it was the most highly cited paper um, that they published. So we were really excited. And I guess the other one that we thought was really kind of cool, um, we were the first journal to publish an article um, that had an animal as a co-author. Um, Sue Rumbaugh published an article with one of her chimpanzees as a co-author. That was kind of, I mean, we actually got written up for science for doing that one. Wow. I didn't know that. <laughs> All the canine researchers at home are going, right. Yeah, that's amazing. Revelation. Yeah. <laughs> So one thing just to tie it back to stress and fear and just issues of like, like that, you mentioned, you know, a hunter, a person that uses a dog in a hunting capacity is not going to call you and say that their dog has a behavior problem. But what happens if they, but they're not trying to bring that dog inside. Right. They're leaving it within the environment that it's comfortable. So just thinking about these, these dogs that are, could you just speak to that topic of trying to assess what is the appropriate environment? Yeah, and I, I, this question of, of where dogs should be um, is, is sort of interesting. And, you know, when you work in New York City, there's this extraordinary environment to be in. Um, you know, when, you know, there's quite literally nowhere to be where there's no other people. I mean, you're always going to be there and there's so much noise and everything else. I'm not sure it's ever good, you know, for it. I don't know if it's New York's a good environment for people, for sure. We're leaving. Uh, <laughs> We're all just leaving. <laughs> um, but, you know, certainly when we look at, at dogs, um, you know, there, there are some right, the good physical environments. I mean, what, you know, honest to God, if I, if I was walking down the street here and I saw somebody with a husky, I'd be worried about that dog. Because I, I really think, you know, a good chunk of the year, that dog is, I think all year over here, it's going to be terrible. Um, you know, and the same thing, I see somebody with a whippet, you know, over in, in you know, Maine. Um, you know, what's that dog going to do for half the year? It's going to have to live in the house inside of a little sleeping bag or something. So you've got that component. But then, and I don't think anybody ever thinks about that. I mean, they get a dog and they don't even think about the environment. The other part, of course, is this question of what's good for them behaviorally and psychologically. And I think, you know, really one of those questions has to do with can you provide that dog with positive opportunities to, to be aroused and than to fulfill, you know, some of those behavioral sequences. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, maybe it's such a, it's, it's a pretty great idea for a lot of people to adopt older dogs, you know, because their needs for a lot of these things have declined over time. They don't have as much energy. They're gonna be a little bit easier to deal with. I mean, you know, I, I've seen these questions where people have, you know, I'm, you know, I read the paper and it says dogs are great for people. So I'm gonna get my 77 year old parents a Labrador Retriever puppy. <laughs> Believe me, I've dealt with it. <laughs> Old dogs are very special. I have a, a very special yeah. spot in my 
my heart for old dogs. I think they're yep. quite delicious and not in an edible yeah. way, but just in a beautiful way. Well, this is, this is a wonderful way to close. So thank you so much, Dr. Z. And um, 